We are in Genesis chapter 3 right now. Remember, we talked about creation. Uh, and then really, this all would take a lot less time, but I'm kind of turning it into a Bible class. So it is getting you know, just a little more deeper than what it would be if I was sitting down at a kitchen table with somebody going through this and the things that uh, we would spend a lot of time looking at. But I think it is worthwhile here. Uh, remember, this is the question we talked about last week. When you look at Genesis chapter 3, really uh, verses 14 through 19, and, and continuing uh, beyond that, but, but when you look at these, what we call the curses, are these generally uh, descriptive or prescriptive? And what's the difference? We do have a mic, so if you raise your hand, wait for a mic, but... Uh, what's the difference between descriptive and prescriptive? <clears throat> All right, Julia will enlighten us. Go for it. Oh, I don't know about that, but descriptive is describing consequences as a result of the, their actions. And prescriptive is prescribing punishment as a result of the, their actions. Yeah, very good. Um, and, and so you have, these, these are kind of the two options that you look at. The way that it is written would lend you to read these as prescriptive. Would it not? I will, I will, I will. Because this, I will. Because of this, I will. And yet, when you look at <clears throat> the things that are actually stated, they seem to be descriptive in nature. Now that sin has come into the world, this is the way that life is just going to be. These are the repercussions. The, you know, these are the natural consequences of sin being a part of things. Which is why, when you look at... Uh, <clears throat> particularly what we were looking at, verse 16, where we uh, finished up last week, and you look at the consequence that is given to women, generally, uh, when he says, I will greatly multiply your pain um, in the bearing of children, um, let, me, <clears throat> let me go back and read this, I will intensify your labor pains, you will bear children with painful effort, that's the uh, CSB Probably the ESV is closer to what we typically would think. I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain, you will bring forth children. Uh, that makes it sound as if, if this is prescriptive, then basically what has God done at this point? Okay, punish the woman, but how does how is a woman's childbirth become more painful? I mean, what has to happen? <laughs> there has to be some kind of physical change in a child that takes place, right? I mean, that, that's just the way that it is. Some people have assumed, you can read some, particularly from 19th century, you know, 1800 commentaries or such, that assume that now the cranium is larger, so the skull is larger, so it's much more painful to deliver a child, as the case is. You know, but, but the idea, it, the only way to increase the pain in childbearing is to change the physical nature of the mother or the child in some kind of a way. Something has to change in order to do that. Um, or this is describing something that may not necessarily be talking about just the physical pain. Um, I, I, went, I wrote down, I told you I would write down at least my translation for this, and I'm giving this to you because I've taken the time to translate this because this is what I'm writing my thesis on. So that's why you're getting so much information about this. Um, if they came to me and said, you know, Chris, um, we really want to know what the CSHV would sound like for this, this version. 
So how would you translate this? I'd say, well, here's what I would do. I will greatly multiply the sorrows of your conceptions. With sorrows, you will have children. Um, and that's a work in progress still, just so you know. Uh, I didn't double check my singulars or plurals or things such as that when I kind of wrote that down. But the idea is I will greatly multiply the sorrow of your conception. Um, that is the sorrow that comes from the conception of a child. And then with sorrows, you will have children. Uh, in the second parallel line, the word there that's for bearing children or having children or whatever cases, that's the same word that's used in genealogies, by the way. Um, you know, when it says that so-and-so beget so-and-so, you've heard that phraseology, right? And so-and-so beget, yeah. Do they talk about women who are begetting there? No, not in the genealogies. They're going down the male line, right? And so in the second line, it's not even specifically about a woman giving birth in, in the parallel part of this. It's just having a child, <laughs> you know, and, and that, that male or female, either one. So all of that to say, and we really talked through this, I don't want to belabor it, uh, but the first part of this is that now the woman's sorrows are going to be greater because sin is in the world. And when she has a child, that child is going to go into sin and is going to cause greater sorrows upon the mother than the mother would have endured without sin being in the world. Does that make sense? Is there anyone who's lost with that? All right. So let's move on then to the next one, because that one's a lot of fun too, right? Uh, the second thing that he says here in uh, 16b, your desire will be for your husband, yet he will rule over you. Uh, there are predominantly speaking, there, there are two different ways that this is understood. I've leaned one way and then I've leaned completely the other way, and now I'm kind of back in the middle a little bit over how to understand this particular passage. So, let's throw it out there. What is meant by the word desire? What do you all think? Who, who has, who desires to give a guess here? Anybody, anybody wanna? Put yourself out there. What, what does he mean? Your desire will be for your husband. Quiet crowd tonight. Over here. All right, Dale, what you got? I don't know that he's necessarily still talking about childbirth. Correct. I think he's talking about the relationship between a husband and a wife. Okay, yes. Yeah, ch childbirth ends with, in pains you will bring forth children. And then he has a B. That, that's A. You know, there, there are two things right here. First is childbirth and pain. And then the second part is the uh, marriage relationship. Uh, so, as Dale says, that's what we're talking about here, is the marriage relationship. Your desire will be for your husband. What does the word desire mean? What is this desire that is for her husband? Go ahead, Kelly. I don't know, but last week you read a different version that made me go, hmm, I don't remember what it was, but it was something like contrary to, or meaning that your, your thought processes won't always align, is what the impression it gave me. Okay. I'm not sure what version that is, but that kind of starts to get the ball rolling just a little bit. 
Um, but yeah, there, there definitely are other translations for this. Uh, Jan, what you got? That was ESV says, your desire shall be contrary, oops, contrary to, and it doesn't finish, hang on. <laughs> but it's in the ESV. Okay, and it must be a, an updated such of ESV. I've, I've got one a few years. Keep in mind, they, especially the uh, digital ones, they run updates you know, very frequently. Um, so, because the ESV has your, your desire shall be for your husband, the one that I have with the footnote, or against. And the ESV that Jan has, your desire will be contrary to uh, your husband. All right. So maybe that's what I read, or Jan read it last week, but maybe I read out of the ESV that was on my phone. All right. What does that mean, though? That your, your desire will be contrary to your husband. <clears throat> have you guys talked about this before? I mean, this, this isn't the first time that you guys have gone through Genesis 3, right? Okay, there's a hand right over here. So, I, I'm curious to know what's your history? You, you don't have to tell me the answer I'm looking for. I mean, I'll, I'll tell you you're wrong if you're wrong, but you know, that's, that's okay. Uh, go ahead, Josie. Maybe is it that your desire shall be to rule over your husband and it's but he shall rule over you? Okay. All right. So let's run this path that, that Josie's running us, which I think is what the ESV is trying to get across with your desire will be contrary or against your husband. As Josie just said, um, this is juxtaposed with, he will rule over you, right? Your desire is for your husband, but he will rule over you. Is it possible then that the word desire is the desire to rule over? There's a very, very good reason to understand it this way. And that is how this phrase is paralleled in just the next chapter. Uh, in Genesis chapter 4, you may not even need to flip over there. It might even be on the same page. Uh, Y'all are familiar with the story, right? He, uh, they both present an offering. God uh, is pleased with Abel's offering, uh, but he had no regard for Cain's offering. And then he went and he got upset about it. Verse 6, uh, Genesis 4, verse 6, the Lord said to Cain, why are you furious? Why do you look despondent? If you do what is right, won't you be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at the door. What's the next thing that it says? In verse 6, sin is crouching at the door, then what? All right. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. Do you see any similarities? Do you see any similarities here? All right, do we need to do some jumping jacks or something? Would that, that help you all out? Maybe get the blood flowing, get, get it to where you're like, hey, maybe I can talk tonight in this class. Are we, are we good there? Everybody raise your right hand. Raise your left hand. Both hands. All right, someone needs deodorant. Put them down. Whew. All right, yeah. You guys, get the blood flowing, right? It's okay. It's okay, right? In, in a Bible class setting like this, throw out what you think the answer is, okay? It's not, nobody's going to, you know, look down or, or think any less of anybody or whatever the case is, you know. Um, but it's better if you engage and, and get into it. So, do you see, can you see a connection between Genesis 4, 6 and then Genesis 3, 16? Yeah, uh, you kind of see that. Was that a yes, or do you have a comment? Phrases. Okay, yeah, they use the exact same wording, the desire and ruling over. And what is it that sin desires? What is it that God is warning Cain that sin desires to do? To control him. Sin is crouching at your door, and it desires you. It desires to rule over you, to control you, but you must, 
control it. Now, take that and go back to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 16. Your desire will be for your husband, but he will rule over you. If we pull that parallel from 4 back to 3, then doesn't it make sense that maybe what it's saying is that the woman would desire to rule over her husband, but what's going to be the outcome? He's going to rule over her. Yeah, but he will rule over you. Now, here's the question. What is it about this side of Genesis 3 that would make a woman desire to rule over her husband? Remember, if, if we talk about this being descriptive and not prescriptive, that means God is not zapping women with a desire. He's not saying, well, because <laughs> you did this, there you go. Now you're going to want to rule over the man. This is descriptive. Now that sin is in the world, the women are going to want to, in a marriage relationship, rule over their husband. Why? It's not too deep, by the way. What's changed? Sin. Right? Which means what? Okay, mistakes, but who makes mistakes? Ah. In this particular situation, who makes mistakes? Why does a woman want to rule over the man? Because the men become idiots. The men are given a place of leadership, but in their place of leadership, who are they trying to really please in a sinful world? Themselves. I mean, doesn't this make sense? Now that sin has entered into the world and a man is a sinful man, then a sinful man is going to be out to please, number one, at whose expense? at his wife's expense. Think back, those of you who have spent time married, think back to a lot of your arguments, maybe I should say moments of intense fellowship. Think back to those times that you had problems and uh, times that heads butted. Wasn't it usually because somebody wasn't fully considering the other person in something? Isn't, I mean, not always, I'm not saying it's 100%, uh, it's, but usually, isn't that kind of where it falls down to? And ultimately, it's the job of the male, the man, to lead the relationship in such a way that, and let's, get, let's go ahead and let's get ahead of ourselves. If the man's doing it right, what does that look like? All right, he's sacrificing himself for his bride the same way that Jesus does for the church, right? Ephesians 5, we all get that. If the man is doing it right, then he's not being selfish, he's not doing stuff for himself, he's doing stuff for his wife in order to honor her, please her, have the best for her, right? That's if he's doing it right. That's if he's following the example of Jesus in the church. That's not what is generally the case. And, and I hope th that's what you're kind of seeing here. Right now, men are given the place of authority, and even if they're not given it, generally speaking, not in every society, I understand that, generally speaking, who has dominated the relationship, men or women, throughout time? Men. And they've done so because of what? Somebody said something. What? Because of strength. And sometimes it just boils to that. They just dominate over the woman, and the woman has no recourse against it. Historically speaking, throughout time, in most general situations, you, I mean, we, you can bring up exceptions and all of that. Generally speaking, though, 
men have been the dominant leaders because they have been dominant over the women. And oftentimes, most societies, you don't have societies that are nearly as egalitarian as our society is today. You know, women were just kind of something that's there for when they have certain lusts that they need to fulfill, and they could fulfill it, take care of it, toss them aside, do whatever. You know, they, you know it, it's just not that big of a deal. That has been the horrid, horrific uh, consequence of men being sinful, making stupid, selfish decisions and not caring an ounce about what their wife actually wants or desires. They're simply out for themselves. If you are a woman and you have that kind of a relationship with your husband where he just simply does anything and everything that he wants, he doesn't care about you and what you want, he just makes selfish decisions and oftentimes selfish decisions Selfish decisions, um, how are those going to go? Not very well, right? Um, If you are in that situation as a woman, what might you be tempted to think? Let me put it this way, for those of you who aren't a woman and haven't been in that situation, have you ever had a boss in a job that just didn't know what he or she was doing? I mean, according to you, right? Everything that they did was a mistake, and if only, you know, I mean, it didn't matter. Whatever decision they made, it was just always the wrong one, and it caused more work for everyone else. And what was your thought? Okay, things would run a whole lot better if I were the one in charge. How many of you guys, come on, have ever had that thought before? Okay, thank you. I was like, nobody? Nobody's going to say that you've never had that thought before. Yeah, things would run a whole lot better if I were in charge. I wouldn't make those mistakes. I wouldn't do those things. You know, I've got a lot better grasp of this. Why might women who are in a position where they are now married to a selfish person who makes the decisions, but he makes bad decisions and brings them to ruin in various ways, is it possible that she might think, you know, things would be a whole lot better if I were in charge? Can you see that? Yeah. Is it possible that that is the descriptive curse now. Your desire will be to rule over your husband. Now that we live in a sinful world, now that that cat's out of the bag, now that this is the way it's going to be, you're going to sit back and say, man, I wish I had the reins in this relationship because I don't at all like the way that he's doing it. If he's doing it sinfully and selfishly. Your desire will be to rule over him. Unfortunately, for the women, again, exceptions aside, the men rule over them. That has been the way that is. Can you see how this fits? Any confusion from anybody? All right, now I said that there were two ways to look at it. That's been the way that I tend to look at it. I still lean that way, but there's another way that um, eh, it, it carries a little bit of merit, perhaps. And it is probably the more common way that people have looked at this. That is desire meaning what? All right, a sexual desire, that your desire will be for your husband. Um, uh, And that's kind of just historically, I think, really the way that people have looked at this. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. Um, And 
Yeah, to some degree, there's, it's kind of problematic because what were Adam and Eve told to do? One of the few, you know, commands that were given to them. Hmm? All right, be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. To do that, what has to happen? This is, I'm, I'm not, not digging deeply here, guys. This, this is, this is uh, They have to make babies. They have to make babies, right? You know, that has to happen. So how could it be a curse to say, well, you will be sexually attracted to your husband? How could that possibly be seen as a curse? Anybody have any ideas why that could be seen as a curse? I think you said if the husband is ugly, is that, is that what I heard? Okay. No, thank you for trying though. I, I, hey, I, I told you earlier, throw out your comments and uh, I didn't expect any as bad as that one, but hey, you know, just throw them out there anyway. And uh, <laughs> no, I appreciate that, yeah. Why else though? Why else might this be considered a curse to have a desire for your husband? What did he just get done talking about? Pain in childbirth. Even so, knowing that the pain in your childbirth is going to now extend, it's, it's going to multiply greatly, um, even so, what? you're still going to face it head on and have that desire for your husband and continue to desire to make babies um, you know, and to multiply and fill the earth. That e even with this, you still are cursed with the need, the inbuilt need to multiply and fill the earth. And then the last little bit then would be, and your husband uh, will have rule over you. Can you see how that one also could potentially uh, work as a curse in this scenario if you attach it to the pain, the increased pain uh, in the bearing of children? All right. Any questions on that second part of verse 16? I don't have as much to say on this because I'm cutting my paper at the childbirth part and I'm not even dealing with the rest of verse 16. So my entire paper, yes, is going to be over two lines and that's it. Um, so any questions on verse 16 as a whole before we move into verse 17? So everyone's good there. All right, I expect good essay questions then, answers on the quiz next week. Um, so, you, since you guys say you got it. All right, moving on then, we're now going to move to whom? Adam. All right, so 17 through 19 now is the man. I'm going to go ahead and erase this. And that'll give us a little bit more room here so I can write just a little bit larger. All right. So 17 through 19 are now given to the man. Um, so he said to the man, verse 17, because you have listened to your wife and you ate from the tree which I commanded you, do not eat from it. The ground is cursed because of you. You will eat from it by means of painful labor all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. You will eat bread by the sweat of your brow until you return to the ground since you were taken from it. For you are dust, and you will return to dust. All right, so let's start talking about this one. So, he said to the serpent, he said to the woman, he said to the man. Um, it's interesting, <clears throat> 
that in verse 14 and in verse 17, you have a phrase that you don't find in verse 16. What is that? All right, because, because you did this, because you have, whether it's in verse uh, 14, because you have done this, or verse 17, because you listened to, uh, to your wife and you ate from the tree. So in either of those, I'm not sure if there's anything that I can pull out of that, but it's just interesting that you have this phrase, because, that these are causative statements um, based on what they've done that is not given to the woman in verse 16. And also, because you've done this in verses 14 and 17, what's the outcome in both of them? A curse. Um, now, who finds it, or, or what's cursed in verse 14? The serpent. What's cursed in 17? The ground. What does not get cursed, very specifically, in verses 14 through 19? Yeah, neither Adam nor Eve are said to be cursed. Uh, they, the curse occurs around them. It's the serpent and it's the ground that gets cursed. Um, so, if we were doing a really detailed look through Genesis chapters 1 through 11, which, you know, we may do at some point, we would really delve into this a little bit and say, aha, what's going on here? Why is that? But we're not, so I'm just planting that seed right now for you to uh, wake up in the middle of the night, a couple nights from now, and be like, huh, I wonder why Adam and Eve weren't cursed. Now I've got to think on this, and I won't be able to get to sleep for three hours. So... That's just throwing that out there for you. Um, you, the curse or the ground is cursed because of you. Uh, boy, this one's, I raced it. The descriptive versus prescriptive. How do we understand this one as descriptive and not prescriptive? Because it certainly sounds like it's prescriptive, doesn't it? He says, all right, I'm zapping that ground now. What do you all think? How does the ground get cursed simply because sin is in the world? Say that again. All right, so the, the plants that he grows, he will have to work harder, and, and he has to work harder because of the curse, right? Um, so that part that Jason's talking about is clearly descriptive, uh, that his, his uh, and we'll talk about how his labor, uh, he will within labor and by the sweat of his brow and all of that, um, how that is clearly a descriptive term. But what about the ground being cursed? Doesn't that sound like God is zapping it? Kelly? Well, before they didn't have to work, the food was just there for them. It's my understanding. They had mm -hmm. to pick the tree, just pick whatever they wanted to eat. And now they have to work at it. So maybe God was doing the work before? I, I don't know. Okay. Who was basically the first gardener? Wasn't it God? Did I hear that back over here? All right, good job. Was that, was that Lucy? All right, good job, Lucy. Yeah, God was the very first gardener. And remember how we talked about a garden may not be at least our view of what a garden is, my view of what a garden is. I'll just say that, growing up and having to work you know, in gardens and how much I hated it, uh, I don't think that's the picture of what was there. We said maybe it was more like a what? More like an orchard. It was trees that supplied every food that they needed. Uh, and they could just go and gather and, and eat. 
Do they still have access to that? I, I, I'm trying to figure out. Hold on one second. Wait for the mic to, to get there. Um, all right, say that again. As long as they work. Okay, as long as they work, they can, yeah, but again, uh, do they have access to not having to work hard and labor? I mean, that, that's gone. And there's this picture, I think, that we get that when the gardener, the one who holds and sustains and does all of that, where is he now? This side of Genesis 3, where is he? Compared to where he was before. He's in heaven. Okay. And we're not. <laughs> okay. He's now separated from his creation, is he not? A separation has occurred. He has walked out, whereas he would walk in and be a part of it. Now, because of sin and sin being in the world, now he has separated himself. That doesn't mean that his fingers aren't still in the world in various ways, but there is a clear line of separation that has come in because of sin. And no longer is he, is this just simply part of, you know, his place. Now he's created that separation with the intent and the desire, and that's getting ahead of ourselves, of one day that being gone, you could say. Um, but there is a real difference between God's interactivity, his interconnection, his taking care of the ground in Genesis chapter 2 that is absent. Genesis chapter 3 and, and on. Yeah, Jan said the, they're, they're the veil that we kind of talked about this morning, that separation, the veil with the cherubim that, you know, literally, we, we haven't got there yet, but when we get to the end of Genesis chapter 3, he will establish a cherubim that is there with the sole purpose of making sure that we don't get back into this Garden of Eden again. I mean, that, that's, that's his job, is to keep man out of it. Um, can, can you kind of see this picture, at least as I'm trying to paint it? Does that kind of make sense? Um, all right, so... <clears throat> um, yeah, and uh, Kevin, if you guys uh, just kind of made a, a point there, and, and I think... Uh, goes right along with what John brought up last week, unless I'm mistaken. I think it was John. Um, Kevin makes, made the comment, the serpent is cursed to the ground, and the ground is cursed, uh, you know, for the, for the sake, for, for the, what's going on with them. So um, I think that's very astute. And, and like I said, John brought this up last week, that with the curse on the serpent, it talked about dust, eating dust all the days of his life. The ground is called what? Dust, right? He's going to tell them from dust you came, you know, to dust you will return. Or, well, you know, you will return to the dust for from it you were taken, from dust you came to dust you will return. It's the end of there in, in verse 19. Um, so there is a, a connection with the curses and those Curses really having something to do with this ground, with this creation, in a sense. Things are now different. Um, and he says, because you've listened to the voice of your wife, you've eaten the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. The ground is now cursed because of you. In what, 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 what does it say there in verse 17? What do you all have? In what? In toil, okay? All right, in toil. What does anyone else have? In pain, you will eat of it. In toil, you shall eat of it. Anybody else have anything? 
different? In sorrow. I liked that one, actually, quite a bit. Um, yeah, it, <clears throat> the CSB puts it, um, let's see here, painful labor. You will eat of it, uh, eat from it by means of painful labor. Um, I like sorrow because the word here is the exact same word used in verse 16. It's the word that we spent so much time talking about. In pain, you will bring forth children. You will have great pain in your conceptions, right? That word for pain that's used there is the exact same word that's used for labor here in verse 17. And so it's Eve's sorrow. Remember I said I, that I think it's not necessarily physical pain so much as it is the emotional, psychological pain or grief or sorrow that's under discussion. Well, I think it's the same thing for the man uh, who is cursed, that you, um, you will eat from it by means of sorrowful labor, or in sorrow, in grief, is the idea. Um, let's see here. Curses the ground because of you. In sorrow you shall eat of it all the days of your life, or in grief you shall eat of it all the days of your life. It's not just a physical uh, discussion of the physical thing of working. There's a word I'm not coming up with, and you guys probably have got it. You just want to belt it out. That's fine. Um, but the, it, we're not just talking about the physical nature of what intense labor is. It's the psychological part of it, too. It's the emotional part of now um, having to labor. Why? What, what psychological, emotional part is involved in having to labor to eat? Go, hold on. L l wait for the mic to get up here, John. So, All right, John, go ahead. I think there's a connection here that Adam and Eve, because they ate of the knowledge of good and evil, they understood some things because of knowledge that it, it takes something to die in order for something to grow. And they eat, eat for a while, but they're going to have to eat again. Um, they're never satisfied. They have to continue to eat for the next day's food, work for the next day's food. And even at that, they're going to see their bodies deteriorate. They're going to see, see the things just fall all over the place. They get the garden all cleaned up and thistles come back. And that's an interesting concept right there. Mm -hmm. They didn't have pesticides like we do, I don't think. Um, it's, that's brought up later in, in the next chapter then. That um, uh, God determines that he's going to have to get them out of the garden because they know now. And this knowledge, I think, is attached to the, the sorrow of both a man and a woman. They know what's missing. They know that God's missing. They know that the, shortly they're going to know that the orchard's missing, if you will. Um, the food and the grace of food and the quantity of food there was. And the communion of food that they had with the Father. And that's going to be gone. So, I don't know, I think that's, I think that's attached. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, and, and I think, you know, what you're saying, connecting the woman, the man, their, their sorrows that are connected now with this to their greater understanding of good and evil. Morality uh, is, is now a part of this. Um, you know, there's, there's something more to it than just knowing that you got to get your food for the day um, or your, your, your stomach needs some fulfillment. Becky? There's a comment in the chat from Whitney Asher that says, my version says, all your life you will struggle to scratch a living from it. Yeah, I'm not sure exactly which, which translation that one is, but I think that's getting to the heart of the, not just the physical, you're going to go out and sweat a lot, but the emotional, psychological portion of what it means to have hard labor. Because let's face it, how many of y'all have done a well-done job before? How many of y'all just, you, you get to the end of the day and you're like, whew, I'm exhausted. 
that was a great day. Have you ever had that before? Yeah. It's not simply the idea of having to exert yourself, laboring, that is a curse, right? <clears throat> it's not just physical labor that's a curse, because physical labor actually can be very rewarding, and, and it can be very good, and you can rest your head on your pillow uh, just feeling good. How many of y'all, though, have had a long day's work, you rest your head on your pillow, but you still can't go to sleep? Why? What's keeping you up? Tomorrow? Yeah, why? What about tomorrow? Okay, you got to do it again. What else? What else keeps you awake? Okay, mistakes that you've made. All right, I saw other hands besides John's go up. Okay, say that again. Worry. Okay, worry. Worry about what? Okay, worry about various outcomes, uh, things that are going to take place. Ryan? Worry about the unknown. Okay, the unknown aspects. You know, that, yeah, you did your work today, but is that work even going to be enough? Uh, go ahead, Kelly. There's, there's times, there's days where, like, I try to work on three or four different projects, and I do the best I can on them, and by the end of the day, I like, I got nothing to show for it. None of them got done. I don't feel like I made progress on any of them. And that can happen not only in our physical projects and our work, but also in our relationships. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, but we are focusing on work, but relationships, are there not relationships? that are involved now in labor, uh, in your work, and dealing now with other people who, by the way, are they upstanding, perfect individuals that you have to work with? No. Usually, they're not. I mean, honestly, I, I pretty much work with pretty good, upstanding people in, in my line, but generally speaking, that may not be the case. Becky? In the chat, Dave Larson says, what keeps you up is the lack of peace that only God can provide through his word. Okay, the, okay. I missed the lack of, yes. Sorry, I, I had to go back through it. No, you said it fine, but I had to go back through it in my head. I'm like, no, actually, you get a lot of peace from his, oh, the lack of peace, yes. Yeah, and that's exactly right. When you have separated yourself from God and from his word, from everything else, if there is no proper relationship because we're on this side of the fall and there's no relationship with God and that has been severed, then that is something that keeps you up. Um, so yeah, go ahead, John. I think there's an important add-on. Prior to this time, this is the first time that any human had this type of sorrow or grief in them, mm -hmm. but there was one before them that knew it immediately, and that was the God himself, mm -hmm. their creator understood that. You, you alluded to the fact that he came walking in the stillness with the translation of the word in the, in the storm clouds of the day that um, he knew. And we're encouraged living in this side of the cross not to grieve the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Like God was grieved that day when the woman took that apple and, or took that fruit and ate it. And he, and he it wasn't a joyous time when he had this discussion with them because that grief was in his heart just as much or more than in theirs or it may be true that the grief that they had at that time was just as much as the father's yeah very much so um and and really this whole scene is going to culminate we're, we're not going to take the time to look over it we're just we're, we don't that's not what this is about but this is going to go into Genesis 4, into Genesis 5, in the genealogy, into Genesis chapter 6. And what happens in Genesis 6? All right. Yeah. Flood. Genesis 6, it's the flood. the flood. The same word is used in Genesis 6 of God that's used here of man and used of woman. 
It, it's, a, it's a variant of, but it's basically the same word that God grieved that he had made man. Remember that statement? That uh, God, you know, some translations say he repented that he had made man, or whatever the case. This word, you know, it has different translations or whatever that, that are used. But here in Genesis, it's used these times so close together that um, you see the curse is that woman will grieve, that man will grieve, and ultimately all of it comes to a head in Genesis chapter 6 because God grieves the same way over sin that's come into the world. Um, and so I, I think, John, what, what you're getting, there, there really is that strong connection over the grieving of God, which doesn't start in Genesis 6, right? I mean, you know, we understand that. Uh, Kevin also said every thistle is a reminder for Adam of what has taken place and what was lost. And, you know, thorns and thistles, it will produce for you. That ultimately is the case, um, that, that everything is a reminder of what has been lost. There, there's the psychological element to this. Go ahead, Josie. I think it specifies thorns and thistles. It doesn't, it doesn't just say weeds, it says thorns and thistles. And this is any connection to Jesus' crown? Uh, I think it 100% is connected to Jesus' crown. Um, you know, Jesus' crown being that was very astute, uh, that Jesus wears a crown of thorns. You know, he takes on the kingship of a sorrowful world is basically it. The greatest crown that Genesis 3, post-Genesis 3 world has to offer. That's the crown that he takes upon himself in one of the most sorrowful, grievous moments. Um, so, very, very good. So coming back to, to verse 17, the ground is cursed, you will eat from it by means of painful labor. And it's not just that you're out exerting yourself, it's the psychological pain. It's the uh, looking at it and saying, have I done enough? We ate today, am I going to be able to eat tomorrow? I've got a family to take care of, and I need to feed them tomorrow. I'm trying to do the best that I can for my family but yet all these decisions that I make end up being the wrong decisions. And now my wife thinks I'm a big dummy and she wants to rule over because I keep doing the wrong things, right? Uh, you know, he's going to have to work. He's going to have to do what he can to, as we would say today, pay the bills. What they would say is to put bread, you know, to make bread, you know, put food on the table, whatever the case is. There's a, a lot of worry, anxiety, grief, sorrow, sometimes the decisions that you have to make, the things that you have to do in order to make that work. Um, you know, as John said earlier, things that you regret, that you wish you hadn't done. You know, all kinds of things are now involved that would not have been involved before. And as Kevin brought out, it's going to produce thorns and thistles. Um, it, and you will eat the plants of the field, and then 19, you will eat what? Bread. What's significant of that? What had they been eating? Bread? Yeah, fruit. Now, it could be this is a generic word for food. Could just simply be that. Or, maybe it does mean bread. Because bread is an undertaking compared to going, grabbing fruit, and eating it. There's a whole process involved in order to make bread that has to till, you know, clearing the ground, tilling the ground, planting your seed, you know, weeding the seed, watering the seed, letting the seed rise up, getting it, harvesting the seed. And then you have to take the seed, find a way to separate it out so that you can then grind it uh, and then have the flour and uh, bread it. I don't, I don't make bread. Uh, whatever you do to flour in order to create bread, you have to do all of that stuff, right? And once you've done all of that, then you can eat what you just walked out to the tree and ate before. Can you see a difference? 
It's going to be different. You will eat by the sweat of your brow until you return to the ground since you were taken from it, for you are dust, and to dust you will return. And that's where we'll start next week with this statement, for you are dust, and to dust you will return. Any questions, further comments, or anything before we close it up? Fantastic. I, I know I, I, I was pulling teeth at the beginning. Sorry if I made you feel uncomfortable by raising your hands and stuff like that. I just I wanted, I wanted muscle memory of hands going up, so that's why I had you do that. So, and it worked. Great conversation, great comments. Really appreciate it. All right, we'll turn things over then to Richard at this point.